just wait. <laughs> Writing this up brought me right back to my university days, which are much longer ago than I thought they'd be. Okay, so we are live, and I can hear myself. Let me just mute that. There we go. Um, so welcome back, guys, to number nine, I believe, of the Back to Basics uh, program where we're taking a couple of employees at Trade Ideas and teaching them about trading uh, kind of from soup to nuts or beginning to end. Last week we wrapped up our lesson on technical analysis. So again if you're new to this channel and you're new to what we're doing, um, you know uh, all of the people you see here uh, basically work at Trade Ideas in some sort of non-trading related fashion. So if you go way back, we have a whole playlist on the main Trade Ideas channel. If you go trade or youtube.com slash trade ideas, it'll be right there in your face where we introduce people. We went to uh, what is a stock, how exchanges work, how brokers work. Then we spent probably 10 or, or well, probably five or six, I guess, uh, lessons in a technical analysis. So if you're interested in that, side of the markets we have tons of videos where we're talking about indicators and uh, candlestick patterns and chart patterns and you know you name it uh, you name it we we chatted about it so now we're going to kind of switch gears a bit and we're going to talk a little bit more about fundamental analysis uh, news um, you know th we'll we'll get into it but this is a topic that's kind of more relevant to our longer term traders and uh, it's important because this is where you guys are going to be. You know, you have a, a job somewhere else, like a lot of people who are trading, and you're looking to kind of uh, enhance your income. You're interested in playing with the market. You know, taking control of your own financial future. Um, longer term charts and longer term studies, like tech or like fundamental analysis, will be important to this as well. Um, but before we get into that, does anyone have any more questions about charts or indicators or candlesticks or anything like that before we get going? No? We're good. All right. So, fundamental analysis. Let's pull us off the screen here for a second. So, you know, this is the definition I ripped from Wikipedia, but essentially fundamental analysis is more of what is going to make sense to you guys but there's a, a reason that I did it second so fundamental analysis is has to talk about things like uh, how is the company doing right is the company making money is the company losing money what sector are they in how is the the sector that they're involved in performing um, really kind of the nuts and bolts right so you know if you're looking at your own uh, finances right as as an individual you're looking at that like what do I own versus what do I owe right what uh, uh, how much do I make versus how much are my expenses you know things like this and this is what more fundamental fundamental analysis is about right so we have just a, a little breakdown below here where we talk about we want to analyze the economy as a whole you know if you guys ever watched really any news it's all about how are the markets doing and how is the economy doing and how is unemployment rates and how are these type of things and this is stuff that we're going to cover a little bit because it is important that you guys have a basic knowledge of this as well as analyzing the sector right if, if you buy a great company but say that great company is in uh, cannabis and there's some regulation that gets pushed that makes it har harder to be legalized that's something that you guys are going to be interested in, right? So finding out what sector the company's in, uh, analyzing the company's financial statements. So are they making money? Are they losing money? Um, are they are they strong or weak? And analyzing uh, the current valuation. Um, so the reason I want to get kind of off the plate right now why this is done second as opposed to technical analysis is essentially because in my mind it's second in importance you know uh, there's a lot of analysts out there there's a lot of Wall Street bankers there's a lot of these types of, of traders and they historically underperform the market pretty drastically um, and it's because it's because of a lot of things and I'll, I'll go through the pros and cons here in a second but just you know it 
this will seem daunting, especially today's lesson, but it will start to get lighter and easier after that. And don't worry, we're not going to be spending an exorbitant amount of time. Uh, the other thing I forgot to mention is I do have the chat open on another screen. So if there's anyone in here watching who would like to ask any questions, uh, just feel free to pop them in there and, and I'll get to them as we go. And as always, you guys, right, this is um, this is for you guys. So pop in, interrupt, ask questions as needed. Um, I keep balancing this. There we go, right in the middle. Um, so what are the pros and cons of fundamental analysis? Why do I suggest people at least understand what it's about, even if there's a lot of traders that don't use them, right? So uh, the pros are just here in order. Great from detecting where the risks may come. So th this is something that I talked about where if you're a great company, but that great company is in a very bad industry, uh, it's going to be pulled down with that industry. You know, if that if the industry is self-driving cars and something happens where self-driving cars get hacked, uh, you know, that's going to be it's going to be a problem. It's good that you might know something like that's on the horizon. Uh, other things that are a little bit simpler is when a company reports earnings, it generally does it when the market's closed. So if you're in a company and they're going to report how much money they made or lost that quarter, when the market's closed, you don't have the ability to act. So in those situations, it's important that you took a bit of time to do a bit of uh, fundamental analysis so you can stay out of the way. You know, it's it's sheer gambling to hold a company into earnings. So it's good to kind of where to hide, right? Also we talked about sector analysis, right? Uh, Bitcoin has just had a monster run over the last uh, two weeks or three weeks or so. So if you were looking for a company that was in that market and you were looking at it for technical reasons, that might give you a little bit more confidence to trade it because it's in a sector that's currently getting hot again, right? Same with uh, weed. You know, there was a while there where all of those companies were going insane and then everything died off. And it, so it's good to know where in the grand universe your stock belongs. Um, a real company. So this is happens a lot with new traders where they want to trade really cheap stocks and penny stocks. So they have a small account, right? So they don't want to buy uh, one share of Amazon, right? They want to buy a couple hundred shares of something. So they gravitate towards the, the cheaper end of the stock. So it's important that you can at least quickly look and see if the company you're trading is doing anything, if they're making any money, if if anyone um, is you know worried about them just completely disappearing to, tomorrow, which certainly can happen. And then why do people care, right? So we talked about in kind of more of the psychology and the technical analysis side of things that your job is not to reinvent the wheel. It's not to uh, you know, discover something that no one else has discovered, right? If you buy a stock, the only way that that stock goes up is if there's a whole bunch of people that agree with you down the line and they push that stock higher. So you want to make sure that there's at least somebody who uh, who cares about the stocks, right? Who is, um, you know, people are talking about it. It's interesting. It's not just going to die and, and no one's going to care. Um, so then what, what are the cons of fundamental analysis? Well, one is it doesn't, it doesn't contain a full trading plan. You know, you can look at a company and say, this company's doing great. It's in a hot sector. It's, uh, you know, they're making a bunch of money. Uh, you know, things are going great. They have a whole bunch of cash on hand. They don't have a lot of debt, you know, all these things, but it, that doesn't tell you where to act. And it doesn't tell you where you're wrong because like any form of analysis here in trading, you can be very wrong, right? So it doesn't contain those areas. And then, also, it doesn't tell you where the company's been. So it's one thing to say this is a great company, they're making a lot of money, they have a lot of money, but if it's already just shot up 10 times its price, then it might not be interesting to buy anymore. So you need to couple this analysis with a more, um, you know, with a more uh, uh, price focused, right? So you can develop, you can put all these things in together into a trading plan. And then the other one is uh, price often moves contrary to news. Uh, we a lot of traders call this buy the rumor, sell the news. Uh, you know, for example, 
you know, a company may come out and everybody knows that they're coming out with this product, right? Everybody knows that in the next few months, Apple's going to come out with a new iPhone because they do it every year around this time. <clears throat> so quite often, if there's a lot of hype going into it, the stock will move higher and higher into this earnings report or into this release. And then when the release happens, the, the stock falls out. It's just because people aren't really that interested in it anymore. Uh, one story that I like to give is we used to have a squawk box. This was way before I was still a trade idea subscriber then. So it was about 12 years ago. Um, but you know, no earnings or no news filters or, or whatever. So my prop firm actually paid a whole bunch of money. It was like a thousand dollars a month to this place that said it had news before everyone else. Um, I remember one stock came up one day and the CFO was indicted. So did something very, very bad. And so I shorted the stock. I said, okay, well, there's the news. I didn't even look at the stock. I brought it up and I, I shorted it. And all of a sudden the stock ripped. And it's just sometimes the market just moves opposite to news. So what may have happened, if you put on your tinfoil hat, is people in the know may have shorted the stock a couple days ago. When the news came out, the stock drops a bit and then you know, they cover and it, it spikes, right? So just because there's news out there doesn't mean that it needs to act rationally. And one of the best indicators out there can be, here's the news. If it's good news and the stock goes down, there might be a reason why that you don't know or something in the charts. And if it's um, good news or if it's bad news and the stock rallies, there might be something there as well. So, you know, on its own, just like I said, with indicators, doesn't really mean a whole lot. But if you tie the two, the fundamental and the technical together, then you can start to get a, a picture. And I actually have a, a stock queued up later for kind of an example of, of something that you might build a trade trading plan around. Um, the other one I put in quotes, they, right? They know new, the news first. Um, it's not surprising to see a stock just rally out of nowhere for three or four days. And then something comes out that, you know, they have a new product or a new service or, something right and, and it just kind of you know they them they they knew the news and they bought it up beforehand uh but it is fairly common and then the last big con of fundamental analysis is it can taint your bias you know i've seen so many people buy a stock and it drops and they say well it's a good company look at all the money they're making you know they're in a they've got this great product that i like and then the stock drops some more and they're like oh but it's a good company and it's a where if they followed a more a technical base approach, it's here's my entry, I'm wrong here, I'm right up here, and that's it, right? I'm going to place that trade and, and hope that the statistics kind of end up on my side that way. So don't be scared. <laughs> so this is a balance sheet, right? This is for, I know a lot of you guys out there are finance individuals, so this won't be too crazy, but... This is, it's important to know this because it will lead into what all the terminology is kind of after this, right? So this is a, a typical balance sheet that you would see in any company. Uh, you have one yourself, whether you know it or not, based off of what it is that you, you owe or own as, as an individual, right? And essentially it's listed with uh, current assets and current liabilities, right? So if you think of an asset for yourself, it's a house, a car, uh, cash, uh, retirement savings, uh, nice jewelry, anything that is worth something that you don't owe anything against, right? Or, or partially don't owe anything against. So a thing that is a benefit to you uh, is an asset, right? So in terms of a company, it will be, you know, the amount of cash they have, the amount of stock they have of, of whatever they're selling, yeah, you know, if it's an oil company, how much oil do they have? These type of things. A liability is just essentially the opposite. So think of uh, debt, you know, things that you have to repay, things that you owe people at some time. And then at the end is what's given to the shareholders, right? So we talked way in the beginning about how, um, you know, how basically a company, uh, you're buying a piece of this company. So basically what you're paying for is a piece of all of the assets minus all the liabilities kind of grossed up by some number that changes fictitiously kind of all throughout the day, week, month, and year. So, but mainly just, I want to get the main 
you know concept down that if you're talking an asset you're talking something that someone owns right they could take to the market and sell and if you're talking a liability it's something that they owe to someone to someone else uh, this is a little bit more important than this but this is just a typical income statement and again you have one personally so on a personal level it would be you know maybe you have some dividends of a stock that pays you or uh, you know just from your job from any type of income that would be your your income numbers right so they it's just, and it's just known as income which again it's important for the terminology we're going to use later next is expenses right so for yourself it would just be rent food car gas insurance right whatever you spend on on a day on a, on a basis now what's important from some of this for later on is that in um, personal right if you work for someone you get your income the government takes its piece and then you pay your expenses whereas how a business works is that you get paid from whatever you sell then you put in your expenses and then then the government takes their piece from the net income right so that's the difference between a human and a business in this whereas you know if you go and you make a thousand dollars the government takes you know 200 bucks or it's probably lower down there i think you guys have much lower income tax rates than we do but um and then you have all your expenses where if a business sells a million dollars in iphones they sell that million dollars in iphones then the government then they get to write off all their expenses it costs to make that iphones and then the government comes and takes their bit so it's a, a bit out of order but again it's you're not going to be studying this stuff just so don't worry about it i just want you to know where all of this terminology comes from um so now we're going to get into the terminology i'm going to bring out my head um load up here so and a lot of this is programmed within trade ideas as well so the scan the stock i'm going to give you and the scan i'm going to give you is going to show a lot of this uh kind of down the road here um so float of a company so the float and you've probably heard of low float stocks before they're they're all the buzz this day and the float is essentially the amount of shares that the company has outstanding so say we opened up a company right we in theory we want to split it equal ways we could in theory have five shares right we could have a share for each of us we would each own 20 percent of the company that's great but if you want to sell your company to the public and you want everybody to be a, a have a part of it you generally issue millions of shares so that it makes the percentage calculation easier right if you've got if we have these five shares of this company and we want to let someone else into our company we have to subdivide the shares but if you do a if we had a million shares right and we just wanted to each have 200,000 shares and then let someone into our company we could give them a, an even number of shares between us and keep the same percentage ownership so the amount of shares outstanding in a company which we'll have to do to market price later is basically the amount of of stock that there is out there so if a company has a million shares of stock and that's it that's the whole move of the company and you see it trading uh, two million shares today that means that the whole value of the company changed hands twice right every pretty much every share in existence and you know people are going to be holding some back so of the shares that are floating out there at least two times that of the company went through so it's a really active stock there's something going on there you know it's important to note that whereas you know someone like apple who probably has a trillion shares outstanding uh if they're doing a million shares a day that's a very small percentage of what the company's worth so this is why people gravitate and and barry is one of them where he trades a lot of uh, low float stocks because less trading is required to move the the stock so therefore what he's thinking is that okay if i buy this company and some buyers come in less buyers need to come in behind me to push the stock in my direction than if i had a big company with lots of shares that makes sense no one's falling asleep yet that's good that was a little confusing okay um uh, 
low float means like there's less people part of the company that own shares, right? Well, not necessarily the other way around. Not necessarily. It means there's just less shares overall. Oh, okay. so, so it's closer to my example of us having five shares as opposed to us having, you know, 50 million shares or something like that. Okay. So then when you're looking at how many shares it takes to move the stock, that's going to be a lot lower, you know, and it's, um, you know, it's going to cause more action. So you, okay. are you saying that smaller companies are like low float because they have less shares? That... Generally speaking. Generally speaking, the smaller companies are more are lower float and bigger companies are more higher float because when a company's been around for a while, they've probably issued shares more. They've had more time under their belt to issue shares where a new company really hasn't had that time. So generally speaking, not always the case, but generally speaking. Um, okay. And that kind of goes into the next one here, which is market cap which is basically your float, the amount of shares outstanding, multiplied by the price of the company. So recently, I'm gonna get corrected if I'm wrong, but I think Apple became the first trillion dollar market cap company, which means it was between them and Amazon, or maybe they both did it, um, which means that if you took all of the shares outstanding for the company, and then you multiplied that by the share price, the whole company was worth a trillion dollars. So to go back to our example, if we had um, we had five shares outstanding, right? Because we just split the company evenly between us. If each comp if each share is worth a dollar, then our market cap's five dollars. If each share is worth ten dollars, then our market cap is fifty dollars. So it it just it gives you rough value of how big the company is that you're trading, right? So again, there's a lot of people out there that only want to trade big cap companies and the reason they want to trade them is because to get that big you have to be reputable right you, there's no company out there that's going to be a real big uh, disappear tomorrow company that has a big cap usually can happen but in most cases if you have a very very small cap company maybe the whole company is worth a million dollars well it's a lot easier that that company is not as legitimate as a company that's a trillion dollars. If a company is a trillion dollars, that means it's got a lot of shares out there. So either it's the greatest scam of all time and they've gotten a trillion dollars worth of investors to buy into them, or it's a, it's a larger reputable company. So quite often, if you have any investment funds with a, a investment advisor, they'll only have you in large cap companies. Whereas a trader, you might be more interested in smaller cap companies because where I said it takes less shares to move a low float company, it takes less dollars to move a low market value company. So, you know, an investor who, if I was a, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna put a million dollars into Apple. Nobody cares, right? Cause that's this tiny little fraction of, of Apple's market cap, doesn't mean anything. If I say, I'm gonna put a, a, a million dollars into XYZ startup, you know, I might own a quarter of the company or a half of the company at that point. So this market cap basically tells you what the value of the entire company is right now based off where the market is. And this will change as the stock price changes. Um, some other filters, and again, we have all these in trade ideas, some other filters that are interesting is how much is held by X, right? So insiders, institutions, and outstanding. So the amount of shares held by insiders are people that work within the company. You know, uh, quite often people will look at a higher insider um, shareholdings as people that are are positive towards their company, right? If if I was just there to make a quick buck and leave, I would be selling all of my shares as it goes on, right? If you're if you're CEO, you usually have a large percentage of the company's uh, shares. And if you want it just to get out, you'd just be selling it as it goes. If you think the company is going to be great, you would then hold on to those shares, wait for the company's price to go up in value, and then sell them before you're about to leave. Uh, same with institutions. Institutions are like hedge funds, big mutual funds, 
uh, the smart money, the big guys. So if a lot of shares are being held by institutions, it basically means that uh, there's probably that smart money, quote unquote, out there that uh, that is interested in this stock, right? So again, people can read into these, just putting them out there as part of your uh, your uh, plan. So earnings per share. This one's very interesting. This is a, a kind of big deal for this. This and short float, I'll quickly go over. So earnings per share is simply the net income of the company divided by the amount of shares that are out there. So if I hold one share of Apple and Apple made a trillion dollars this year, how much did my share make, right? That's basically what people are looking for. So again, in our example where there's five of us and we each have one share, if the company made uh, $50, right? We all made 10 bucks last year, right? It doesn't necessarily reflect to the share price because in the share price is built in what they think of management and market conditions and all of this going forward. But that's kind of a, a big number that people look at. And that's the example that I'm gonna show you in a bit. Uh, earnings date is basically when they announce earnings. Again, just very important, stay out of the way. If you're gonna hold any company overnight, figure out when they're gonna report earnings. If it's when you're planning on holding them, don't take the trade. It's a gamble. Stocks can go up or down 10, 20% overnight and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, dividends we talked about, it's just a payout that some companies do to shareholders. Uh, beta, and I'm kind of racing a bit because just because we're coming down to a bit crunch time, but beta is basically saying how volatile is the company in relation to the market. If something has a beta of five, it means on average, if the market went up 1%, this company goes up 5%, right? It's, it's how volatile is it in, in relationship to. So a lot of people will play high beta names if they really want action, right? If you want a nice slow stock, you might want to look for one that has a very low beta. Um, and the last one is uh, short float and days to cover. And this is one thing that Steve Gomez does all the time. And I've seen him personally do it very, very well, where every now and then the company has to report or the, the regulatory body reports how many people are short the stock. So how many people are betting it to go down? If that gets really, really crowded and the company moves up, we know from our lessons before, people have to buy, right? If I'm short the company and it's moving up, the only way for me to get out of that position is to buy, right? They call that a short squeeze where maybe you didn't want to, but maybe you're losing so much money that the broker's coming and knocking on your door and saying, you need to pay us back your loan, cover the shares. So they're forced to cover the shares. So what Steve Gomez likes to do a lot is he likes to find companies that look like they're gonna be really strong and everybody's betting against them because he knows if he's right and it moves a little bit in his favor, there's gonna be a lot of people that come in and cover and those people are gonna push the, the shares of the company higher. And then days to cover basically being how many days if every trade was somebody covering, would it take for them to cover the shares? So quite often people will say, okay, well, if, if it's gonna take them two or three days to cover all their shorts, then I'm gonna get in. Because then if something happens that's positive, you have this huge blow up where people have to cover their shares and you get this massive spike, which is you know, what I think is happening with Bitcoin right now, to be perfectly honest. Um, I think that's it. So I'm gonna show you guys a stock real quick and there's no questions over in the chat, but if there is, let me know. Again, uh, we got to get your guys' socials up here as well, but I'm at Bonpara on Twitter and youtube.com slash Bonpara on uh, YouTube. We have uh, Facebook for at Trade Ideas Pro, and then any questions about the product or anything like that, just email info at trade-ideas.com. So last but not least, I just wanted to show you this uh, company here. So this is not the one that I was gonna show you, hold on. <laughs> uh, so I built this using Trade Ideas, which essentially is a scan that looks for companies that are have high earnings per share, right? So that number that we talked about, that was how much uh, money a company makes per share over how many shares, right? So for every share, did you make a dollar? Did you make five cents? Did you make 50 cents? Um, 
So this price earnings ratio is basically just reflecting that, right? Um, so a higher number, without getting into the specifics, basically the, a higher number means that they're earning more on a per share basis than a lower number. So I took that and I did a, a bit of a technical search and I said I want to find things that are right kind of near support. So they, they're making a lot of money, but for whatever reason the prices come down and they're at a support area. So then by scanning through this I found Jack in the Box, which I have not eaten at. I did Chick-fil-A last time I was down there. None of these places exist in Canada. So this that was Chick-fil-A was amazing. But uh, I'm jealous that you guys haven't. We don't. So essentially I found a company here on the weekly chart you can see with a the, the price divided by the earnings. Sorry, this isn't earnings per share. It's price earnings. So how much money did they make divided by the price? So a high number means that they're earning uh, the prices, uh, they're earning a lot of money and the price is reflecting that. So Jack in the Box is making a fair amount of money. Uh, with that, you can go into, and this is in the web version as well, we have this single stock window. You can configure this and you can actually type in fundamental and what will happen is all of these different things that I went over on the last screen will be there. So we got market cap, shares outstanding, float, short float, right, held by insiders, held by institutions, everything we went over, as well as how much cash they have versus debt, revenue. So you can pull out what's important to this. So we can take a look at some of these and just add them as a column, and you'll now see them in the single stock window. So this is your homework, where I want you to go and find something that's either uh, making a lot of money and undervalued or uh, is um, the earnings is growing because we have earnings growth so they're making Good question yep. Michael how do we know like what's a number we base that you know decision on like you, what's a lot you know, well what's what am I looking at here I can barely read it it's just I see like 299 what is that so th that actually brings up a very good point where there is no good number or bad number it's all about how relative it is to the other stocks so if I say this company's price earnings ratio is five. That doesn't mean anything to you. But if I say Apple's price earnings ratio is five and Google's is four, right? You see how now it means a little bit more because these, they're competing with each other, right? So then, so the, yeah. The, so I would look at like maybe the one above it or United Insurance because it's doing the best. Right. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to take, because I went through all of these but I want you to take the fundamental side and I want you to add the technical side to it as well, right? I don't want you to just say, this is a high number, so I'm gonna buy it, right? If, if that worked, then you know there'd be no need to teach you guys this, I'd just tell you to do that. But what I want you to do is I want you to say, this is something that has a, a fundamental factor that I like and a technical factor that I like, and that's what I'm gonna take the trade. So it's all about you know putting the pieces together of what eventually will be your trading plan uh, as things go, right? So I went through all of these until I got to Jack and I was like, okay, well, there's a fair amount of support here in Jack. So if I liked the fundamental story, if I like Jack in the box, all of these things, and I want it to um, buy this stock, well, I know I should buy it somewhere near support which is gonna be right around here. And I know I'm gonna be wrong if it breaks the support area because what we talked about in the technical area. So does that make sense? That's the reason why I'm not, I don't want you to really worry about the numbers too much. I just want you so to you look want at us, them relative. You want us to go into the single stock window and go to the configuration window and type in fundamental and do, do we need to put in values or anything? No, it will just show you what they are, and I just want you to compare them to other companies. Oh, I so, I, And I will give you this scan as well, but if you also notice the things that I added in was short float and days to cover, and that the short float is 15%. So 15% of all of the shares outstanding, people are betting that Jack in the Box is going to go lower. And if all of those people started to cover, it's going to take five days for them to get out of the stock. Right, so you can see why you liked Jack in the Box over the other ones. 
Th that and how near it was to support, essentially, right? Oh, okay. The other ones were not that close to support. Exactly. Okay. So and it, this was just so it's got a decent fundamental story that people are decently short on it, and it's near support. Doesn't mean I want you to do anything with this stock, obviously, but it's just what I want you to look at. Where I want you to scroll through this list, which I'll give to you, and think about the technical patterns we talked about, and the uh, the fundamental stuff we just talked about, and bring up this window and just kind of compare them. Just kind of go through and see. You know, maybe there's companies here that you actually know and like their story of, right? I don't know most of these. Again, with, with me, a lot of them are American companies. And as a Canadian, some of them make sense, some of them don't. Um, but you might go through and read about this uh, Vanda Pharmaceuticals with a decent uh, price earnings ratio and uh, decent short float. And you might say, okay, well, let's add a bit of support. This is a triangle pattern we were talking about. And, uh, and want to take a trade from there. So basically, I just want you to add it to what it is that you normally do. Okay, and can you tell me again, like, the short float, what's a decent percentage? I was just going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say anything over 10 is interesting. Basically, if you put 10 people in a room that are interested in the stock, one of them is betting against it. Um, but again, I want you to look relative, right? If, if you start going through this and you find that 10 is what every company is, then it's no longer big, right? It's all about, the, the, part of the thing is there's only one big pile of money that's invested in the stock market. And the question is, where are they going to invest, right? Usually people who are investors don't take their money out entirely. They might go to something like bonds or, or uh, gold or, or something like that, but they don't just, take their money and throw it under their mattress and that's it. So it's trying to figure out where kind of in the grand scheme of things here, uh, which one is relatively outstanding to the other ones. That makes sense? So really we're just gonna look at the short float and compare the short float numbers? I would compare the short floats. And again, it's gonna be what speaks well to you, right? If you wanna see a company that has a lot of cash on hand, a lot of money just to you know, bail themselves out of a bad situation if it occurs, then put cash up there and take a look at that, right? If you want a, a company that's earnings a lot, earning a lot, you might want to put earnings per share up there, right? So it's going to start to be tailored a bit to you. But for now, I'm just going to give you this one that I called value investing dreams, which is just if you're a value investor, you better generally want a high price earnings ratio and a, and a low a company that's moved against it. So for now, just take a look at this. Again, add it to your fund or your technical analysis, um, because I strongly believe technical analysis is way, way more important than fundamental in the long run. So um, this is like a boost to what you learned in the last little bit. Sounds good, Michael. Makes sense. Thank you. All right. So I see no questions in the chat, so I'm going to call it a day here. And I will talk to you guys next time.